Welcome everybody today to this session of the Launch and Learn series. Today I want to share with you some thoughts about shade gardening and include some ideas about strategies that plants use to cope with limited light. Here we see on the, we're greeted by the beautiful flower of Stewardia malacodendron or the silky camellia. Malacodendron means soft wood and the common name silica camellia is of course based on the fact that it's in the same family as the camellia the theacea family this is an uncommon southeastern native and one reason it's uncommon is because it's susceptible to root rot so it has to be sited where there's very good drainage <clears throat> it grows more or less as a large shrub multi-stem shrub or can also be pruned to a single trunk tree. It prefers a uh, semi-shade conditions and uh, particularly under a higher uh, limb pines and if we look at the flower it's one of the more beautiful ones with the bright stamens with their purple uh, <coughs> filaments and uh, the um, bluish anthers. So it makes a great understory tree. The next group of Beautiful understory trees are the <clears throat> Japanese maples. And of course, there are many of them, well over a thousand named cultivars now. And of course, their natural habitat is in the understory. Most of them prefer some shade, but there are several cultivars that will grow and tolerate full sun, as well as others that will tolerate full sh shade. One of the better ones for full sun and our warm temperatures is the, oh, um, oh, the weeping maple, Tamiyuki Yama. And uh, here on the right, we see the Viridus, which is spring colors. It's also an excellent one, but does uh, improve some a little bit with the uh, additional shade. On the Left side of the screen, we see the upright coral bark maple, a sango kaku. Of course, it's called a coral bark maple that, because that when it's exposed to some fall freezes, the chartreuse bark will tend to go to a more of a coral color. Of course, the Japanese maples are selected oftentimes for their multiple colored leaves or unique coloration in their leaves or their unique form in the leaves, also for their unique growth habits. One of the things about them is because they're often selected for the leaf forms and coloration, they do benefit considerably from pruning early on. And, and during the formative years, they tend to, uh, several of them tend to grow with a lot of extra uh, branching sort of a twigging effect and so they can benefit from having some judicial pruning early on. This uh, um, grouping of plants is great for the variation in their forms, shapes, colors, etc. and there's probably one of the best groups for including in a shade garden. Another really nice understory tree is an import from China. This is the Davidia involucrata sonoma, cultivar sonoma. This cultivar sonoma tends to bloom about uh, um, half the time, age, I should say, as the you know, species does. In other words, it takes about 10 years for the species to bloom often, whereas Sonoma, the selection will tend to bloom at three to four years after uh, planting. It is a plant that makes a show because of its two large bracts. It only has two bracts, say the dogwood has four, but it's very similar to that, the two big bracts with the flowers in the center of it here. And because of those large white bracts, it's uh, often referred to as a dove tree or sometimes as the handkerchief tree. It likes a considerable amount of sun in the morning to bloom real well, but of course afternoon shade. It's often you can read where it does not do well under warm temperatures and high humidity conditions, 
but we've had this plant growing for about 12 years and it's performing, it, it, doing quite well. Let's look now at a statement that Alan Armitage, who is a professor emeritus at the University of Georgia, where he did a lot of work with uh, perennials. And he writes that shade is to gardening as Oreos are to cookies. Having too many can give you a stomach ache, but having none is cruel and unusual punishment. That's a nice, interesting way of saying that if you have too much shade, it's difficult to grow even uh, well, the, the more shade tolerant plants. And of course, if you have no shade, then you lose the opportunity to, to grow some of our shade tolerant plants, particularly the ones that have some of the more striking foliage to them. Let's ask the question, what is medium shade? Not an easy answer, and there are many answers out there in the literature. But it's kind of like asking, what is an old flower? If we look here at this spring ephemeral, the bloodroot, this plant, of course, has flowers that last only about 24 hours. So if you have a flower that's old, it's really not very many hours old. Uh, whereas if you take and look at the plant, uh, Cypridium kentuckiensis, the Kentucky lady stepper. This plant is a terrific understory plant and its flowers will last as long as three weeks. And so how old is an old flower in the case of this uh, lady slipper? Well, it's going to be days old. And so it's really dependent upon the term old there is very dependent upon which plant you're talking about. Likewise, when you talk about shade, and try to quantitate it, it's really somewhat loosely defined. And one of the ways to, we often refer to shade is as woodland shade. But woodland shade is really just too variable to you know, quantitate because the amount of shade coming through a woodland is really dependent upon the time of the year, whether you're in the, well, uh, the sun is high in the sky in the middle of the summer or in the winter, lower angles from the sun's rays and time of day, whether it's morning or noon, and the kinds of trees, whether they're deciduous and evergreen and whether they're tightly branched evergreens or not. So it's very difficult, again, to define shade. But one of the more uh, highly adopted ways is that if you look at full shade as representing about when you have only a about 10% uh, or less direct sun. And then medium shade, which when you have about 30 to 50% sun exposure. And even under those conditions, you can have a couple of hours of sunlight, particularly um, in the early morning or afternoon. And then if you have light shade, you could think of it as having more than two thirds of the day light hours of, uh, in sunlight. I'll be discussing some plants that do well under medium shade on the higher end of medium shade or the lower end of medium shade. So this gives us at least some sense of the quantity of light when we're talking about medium or light shade, for example. One of the better, uh, oh, I should say really more popular understory shrub groups are the native deciduous azaleas. One of the highest uh, concentrations of those, the greatest diversity of our native uh, deciduous azaleas is in Alabama and Georgia. And there are about a dozen of them that uh, do quite well in our areas. One of the best in, is this one called Rhododendron alabamensis. One reason I like it so well is, is it has foliage from the lower portions of it, branches all the way up. It's a uniformly, uh, a uniform foliage coverage. It's very floriferous. It's kind of a shorter, slower, compact grower. So uh, it doesn't get as large as some of the uh, um, other uh, deciduous natives. Of course, being in the Alabamensis, it has that bright yellow blotch that's characteristic of it and a rich lemon scent. This particular cultivar here, Nancy Calloway, 
is very, very floriferous and uh, seems to be very disease resistant. Again, only being about four or five feet tall, it will take a lot of shade, uh, at least 30%, but sometimes less, and still give you a good bloom coverage. Compare that to the rhododendron canescens. Canescens means gray, which is, uh, refers to the hairs on the leaves and giving a kind of a gray overtone to the leaves. This selection is Barnado's Phlox Pink. It produces very large trusses in the early spring. The rhododendron canescens is one that um, gets much larger than, for example, than the Alabamensis, because 10 to even 10 feet or even larger. But it does also prefer a little bit more light in order to bloom well. A morning sun and afternoon shade, it will give you a, a considerable amount of light. Oftentimes people will plant the native deciduous azaleas under considerable amount of shade and then be disappointed in the lack of flowering that they get. If they have a lot of shade, try the uh, Alabamensis as opposed to uh, some of the others that may re considerable, require considerable more shade. I'm sorry, considerable more sun. Another good uh, shade tolerant plant that has the advantage of blooming in the fall is this perennial, the toad lily. And the toad lily is called Tricertus herta, tri meaning three, and refers to the three different sepals that you have here with the large swelling or bulge at the base, which is the nectary, which provides the term certus. So this three, you know, these three bulges or tricertus effect is uh, uh, the basis for the name of this particular perennial. These nectaries down here at the base are ready-made for insect pollination and as an insect pull, uh, stops in, dips its head down to get uh, some of the nectar, its back end would come up to ready to the, the uh, plant being ready for pollination with the anthers noticed all leaning over and where it would be quick to, for a, a good transfer of pollen. This is a common feature of some of our uh, um, pollen, insect, insect pollinated flowers such as the passion flowers, for example. The toad lily likes shade, although it can, can or, or accept a considerable amount of sun, particularly morning sun. It does well in that famous moist but well-drained kind of soil, and uh, it does spread somewhat reasonably well. Uh, it's not weedy though. It's a resistant to um, deer, but unfortunately not to rabbits. But again, it, it makes an excellent shade plant, a tolerant plant for the, particularly in the fall season. Of course, the hydrangeas are the queen of flowering shrubs, and there's about 70 different species of hydrangea. Uh, some would say only about 40, but still a considerable number of them. And really only about five of them are commonly grown in our gardens. In this particular one, we see the hydrangea arborescence, which is our native hydrangea. And this is the Annabelle selection that has been around for a, quite a long time and is a great performer where you can cut it back in each spring down to about a foot, foot and a half, and it'll come back with a uh, nice floral display. About 10 years uh, ago, they found a couple of uh, pink and reddish uh, toned flowered uh, 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 specimens. And those were taken by Tom Ranney at North Carolina State University. And he worked with them and has bred them to where now there are some pink cult cultivars out there that are in the Invincible Spirit series. The first one he released was a little bit weak stemmed, but the Invincible Spirit two is a strong stem variety that uh, has done quite well and makes a nice show uh, contrast in the garden with the white one. Um, 
<clears throat> one of the issues with the uh, hydrangeas is that there are probably over 700 named varieties now, but unfortunately some of the name, uh, some particular plants have received more than one patented na name. Still lots of opportunity for variety of choices. Another hydrangea species is the hydrangea serrata. The uh, one is not nearly as robust as our more uh, popular macrophyllas, but it is a little more hardy because it's native to the north mountainous islands of Japan and therefore the buds are tend to be a little less susceptible to our late frost so it tends to bloom uh, quite well uh, in most all springs even with cold winters although we have not had many of recent time. Um, the same species, Hydrangea serrata, has some couple of cultivars that are quite interesting. This one is called Golden Crown. It uh, has bright yellow new growth and there are several other uh, species of both the macrophyllas and the serratas that have yellow uh, new growth, but this one is a winner because it retains those yellow highlights most all summer long. And uh, it grows quite well in considerable shade. It will take uh, a morning sun, even some afternoon uh, shade uh, will help it. But I've also grown it in full shade all day long and it still uh, gives you that nice, beautiful and bright yellow uh, uh, new growth. Of course, being a hydrangea, serrata, it does bloom with these uh, flowers that are really kind of a modest lace cap. So this plant is really would be to make this best show in a dark portion of the garden due to its foliage as opposed to its flowers. Again, looking at foliage, and the bright coloration of foliage to give you uh, something in addition to flowers, particularly in a shady garden where sometimes the shade limits the amount of flowers you get. It's a nice asset to have the striking foliage that can add significantly to a shade garden. And of course, one group that's uh, some recent uh, selections uh, are the gar variegated gardenias. This is a gardenia that is known as gold doubloons or in Japan, ogan no hana, ogan meaning gold and hana meaning flower. Of course, in reference to the bright gold leaf that reminds one of a flower. Uh, again, being a gardenia, it does flower produces in fact these beautiful double white flowers with some uh, fragrance and uh, unfortunately it doesn't produce a lot of them but it does produce some that enhances its uh, showiness. Another form of this same species is this double variegated form. It doesn't flower, its flower count is even lower only occasionally will it flower, but when it does flower, it likewise produces this double white uh, flower. It will grow and retain that uh, brightly variegated foliage all winter long, and it, uh, in addition to that, will produce that foliage even under the higher shade conditions. Many variegated plants under uh, low light uh, don't always give you that nice variegation. Always want to plant uh, um, gardenias uh, on a, where they get morning shade if possible. That will minimize some of the damage that occurs in the winter time to them. If there's one plant that is, should be in every shade garden in our, our client gardens in, in Birmingham, it's the plum use. The plum yew is in a very adaptable plant, very versatile in the sense that it will grow under full shade and talking about full shade. Um, 
It'll grow, interestingly enough, under full sun, although it's not quite as happy in full sun, but it will grow and look reasonably decent even under full sun. So it is extremely adaptable to the amount of light exposure it gets, which makes it an asset to be used in many places in the garden. In addition to that, it also has multiple forms. You can get these prostrate forms that are only about 10 to 12 inches tall and uh, giving it some time, uh, 10 years, it'll spread, give a spread of about 10 uh, feet under reasonably good growing conditions. It also will have a, a forms that are available that are fastidiate or upright, if you will, pillar-like. There are other forms that are sort of whorled uh, or shuttlecock type in their growth, such as the Utopia or the Duke Gardens. Duke Gardens are slightly larger in form than the Utopia. Uh, another benefit of that growth is that it's uh, kind of a bright uh, foliage when it comes out anew in the spring. Another corresponding uh, uh, um, conifer is the true taxis. Uh, this is cuspidata, cuspidata meaning uh, sharp tips to the leaf points, to the leaves. And this one is a selection called dwarf bright gold. It's a slow grower that has this bright gold foliage for at least six weeks, particularly uh, in the uh, exposures where it gets some morning sun and the rest of the day, it'll tolerate shade quite well. So this is a very versatile plant that can be used lots of places and uh, the uh, cephalotaxis likewise can be used. Uh, it's the one that can be used but lots of places, quite versatile. The other conifer that I think should be given some attention to is the, this particular witch's broom, broom selection. It on uh, the dawn redwood. It only grows about four to six inches a year. So it's slow growing, but again, it's adaptable. You can grow it in full sun or under shady conditions, which is where this plant was growing under shady conditions and uh, goes from more of the yellow hues to more of a creamy hue of the uh, foliage. And then in the fall, because it's a deciduous plant, a foliage turns sort of a russet brown shade. This is a plant that in addition to being slow growing, it responds very well to pruning and can be shaped and kept in uh, whatever size range that you want. So another one that I think needs to be given as much attention to uh, inclusion in a shade garden. This one is from Germany, a selection out of one of the German. The term metasequoia, of course, means close to, or sequoia-like. The Glyptostroboides species name, uh, Glyptostroboides is referring to the deeply fissured fruits of that particular plant. Now we've been talking about the uh, quantity of light, the amount of light, the amount of shade and uh, sun. But the quality of light is, can be also important. And when we talk about the quality of light, we're talking about the colors of light in the visible wavelength range. Of course, visible light is a part of the overall electromagnetic magnetic spectrum, which ranges from the low energy radio waves all the way up to the high energy gamma rays. And so the visible light represents just a small portion of this overall spectrum. And within that small portion, uh, we see that we have uh, ranges from the shorter wavelength violet light all the way through the spectrum to the longer wavelength and lower energy red light. Then the quality of light is also important because in order for light to be useful to the plant, it's got to be absorbed the plant has to capture that light. Well, what is going to capture the light? Well, we refer to them as pigments, but they're molecules that can absorb certain select wavelengths of that light, or if you will, certain select colors of the light and not, so, not necessarily absorb others. For example, if we talk about photosynthesis, which is of course the using light energy to synthesize our chemical energy or synthesize sugars, 
the light has to be captured. That sunlight is captured, of course, by a pigment known as chlorophyll. And of course, chlorophyll selectively uh, uh, absorbs the blue wavelengths and the red wavelengths. And when it does so, it does rather inefficiently because in the case of light from the sun, only about 3% of it is captured by plants. So there's a lot of room for improvement of increasing the amount of light that uh, a plant absorbs. Even increasing it from three to 5% makes the plant much more vigorous and productive. The majority of the light is uh, reflected off of the surface of the leaf or it can be transmitted through the leaf. So if we then look at one of the strategies that plants need to use to make it possible to grow under limited light conditions, they can make optimum use of the available energy that they have. In other words, maximize the light captured for photosynthesis. And we've, as I've already mentioned, there's lots of room for it, increasing the amount that is captured. Sometimes the strategies plants use are very simple. And by simple, we see uh, just whether there's a presence of hairs or not any. If we look at this particular slide, we see that this is an electron micrograph where you see the middle of the leaf here, the mesophyll portion. Here's the upper epidermis. You can see some glands on the surface of the upper epidermis. This is the lower epidermis here. And you can see some hairs on the underneath side as, where, as well as some hairs on the surface of the leaf. And these star-shaped hairs make more or less like a blanket over the surface of the leaf. And these star-shaped uh, hairs are like ones that you might find, for example, in hibiscus. But with the presence of this blanket of hairs, then the leaf is going to uh, absorb considerably less amount of light. A glabrous leaf, that is a leaf with no hairs on it, can absorb more than 50% more light than, for example, a hairy leaf does. So the take home point is very simply that the shade tolerant plants tend to produce much less pubescence or hair on their surface, leaf surfaces. One example of that is these shade tolerant hellebores or Lenten roses. Now the hellebores are of course native to Croatia and Slovenia, the Balkans, and there are several species that have been collected over the years, probably back as many as 50 years ago. There were groups in China, in, uh, Germany and England, and here in the US, a couple of groups uh, that collected these uh, variety of, of, of species that are available and then started making crosses and back crosses and selections uh, from those crosses. And that research and work has been ongoing for probably 50 years now that in the fruition of that, those efforts have finally started to be realized. Whereas in the last about 10 years, we're starting to see a large number of very nice, uh, hybrids of these particular crosses, resulting from the particular crosses of these species. Here's one that is from Germany. It's from the, what they call the HGC or the Hellebore Gold Collection. This is one that starts blooming in late fall and will bloom almost five months on into uh, spring, one called Joseph Limper. It's a very good, strong bloomer many, many blooms on it. Uh, of course, other forms are available where they have multiple petals, uh, double flowers, if you are, uh, <clears throat> flowers being doubled with really multi-petaled forms, lots of different markings and uh, kinds of markings, some picoteed and so forth. And when we are looking at these uh, Lenten roses, we can now find quite a few of the hybrids available. And they, of course, being hybrids, tend to be sterile, so they don't produce as many of the sort of seedlings, of the seedlings that can kind of become weedy. 
and uh, they may cost a little bit more, but they have some beautiful uh, specimens that are out there today. The Linton rose tends to produce a kind of a fleshy root and can wrap around on itself a lot. So it's important to get it off to a good start to be sure and loosen the roots before, uh, when it comes out of the pot, loosen them before putting it into the soil. Of course, the Linton roses are known for their drought tolerance and of course their shade tolerance. And just keep in mind that they really do appreciate, however, some, some considerable moisture in the fall and in the spring when they're actively growing. Another characteristic that's being uh, sought is these uh, showy green, uh, kind of gray green model leaves. And these uh, give the plant some uh, interest in the garden, even when it's not in flower. <clears throat> Now, looking at the quality of light again, or the wavelengths and uh, color of light, another thing to keep in mind is that if you look at <clears throat> the sunlight that's coming in on the top, uh, striking the top of a canopy of trees in a forest, for example, that sunlight that is striking the top of that tree canopy has, of course, all of the different wavelengths of light, and colors of light, if you will, represented. But notice now that when the light goes down through that canopy and absorbed by the tree leaves, that a lot of that light, only about 0.3 or 4% of the light in these ranges here, where the blue, the green, and the yellow, and orange, and so forth, a very small portion of it gets through. So for the plants that are down on the forest floor, uh, they don't have access to much of these colors of light meaning that they are very dependent upon the red light that does tend to come through the canopy more so. So uh, in shade, the red light accounts for as much as 40% of the light used by those plants that are growing underneath of that uh, tree canopy. Now, that red light will become, uh, is, is what the plant has available to it, but which plants can use that red light most readily? Well, keep in mind again that if you take, for example, and put uh, some seedlings and uh, put them in a windowsill, and like in these beans, of course, there's unilateral light coming in from the window. That light can be absorbed or sensed. And remember again, for the light to be uh, of any value or to be used by the plant, it has to be absorbed and recognized by some pigment or absorbed by some pigment. That enables the plant to recognize that light coming in there. And when that does so, a pigment called phototropin is uh, in this particular plant and it absorbs the blue light. So as it absorbs the blue light coming in, the plant responds with a growth towards the source of light. So you get phototropism, light, with a tropic or a growth response. Well, one thing to keep in mind again is if you're a fern on the floor of the forest, there's not much blue light that's coming through. So the fern wouldn't tend to grow towards that light. But ferns have another pigment, one called neochrome. And that pigment senses both the blue and absorbs also the red light. So the blue and red light being sensed enables ferns to see that red light that comes through the canopy. And it gives ferns an advantage in light beneath the tree canopies that are rich in these red wavelengths of light. So another little trick that they use. When it comes to ferns, of course, there are a lot of them out there, but ones that are evergreen tend to be a nice asset in the garden. And one that's most popular right now, or one of the more popular ones is one called autumn fern. It's called autumn fern, of course, because it takes on the foliage you know, that's young in the spring, takes on a bronzy, almost autumn-like coloration. And it's a fern that also is evergreen. 
and it's also upright. Now there's several up uh, evergreen ferns, but very few of them which are also upright and evergreen. This particular fern is called Dryopteris. The Dryopteris, so, um, the dryo means oak or often thought of it just as wood and terrace is fern. And erythro means red and the sori means the covering to the uh, spores on the back of the leaves. And you can see that here where this is where the term, the species, the specific epithet or species like name is the erythro sori, the red uh, spore coverings. It's a beautiful fern and uh, it's one that we tested in the uh, trial uh, gardens at the, uh, at the Birmingham Botanical Gardens in the 1990s. The um, Hardy Fern Foundation has test gardens throughout the United States and about 14 you know, uh, different test sites and the Birmingham Botanical Gardens is one of those test sites and we were we tested this fern in the 1990s and at that time, of course, uh, not as much was known about it, but of course it has performed well. It has the assets that I talked about being evergreen, upright, and today, of course, it's a commercial success and very commonly available. Another fern that's a, uh, a cultivar of this fern is one called brilliance. And sometimes people feel like that that term brilliance is derived from the fact that the bronzing coloration on the leaves is brighter, but that's not really the case. It may last, the bronzing may last a little bit longer, but it's not really any more brilliant, so to speak. But it's a color bar that instead of the red has uh, a, a white coloration to the spores. Another outstanding fern is that has many of the same attributes as the uh, autumn fern, may not be quite as available, but it is becoming much more available, is Champion's wood fern, Dryopteris championii. And it again, in my judgment, is one of the very best. It's evergreen, it's upright in winter, and it has a glossy foliage. It grows in a shuttlecock kind of arrangement of the uh, leaves, very much like the uh, uh, autumn fern does. It's the uh, Champion's fern, is maybe a little bit larger, but it is both of these ferns, the uh, Autumn and the Champions, both are very shade tolerant and very sun tolerant. They will not take full sun all day very well, but they will take a lot of sun. They will take, if you will, light shade above that 66 percent tile level we talked about earlier of full sun. Great ferns uh, to have. They're very, also very drought tolerant. This is another plus on the champion wood fern. It doesn't have the autumn foliage, but it does have these autumn, I'm sorry, these bronzy uh, hairs or on the um, um, stipes or stalks of the leaves. Another fern that, has a lot of uh, benefit in the garden is one called Microlepia strigosa, the lace fern. And it is called Microlepia because it has, Lepia means the, refers to the hairs on it, uh, the uh, stalk, and they are very small ones. And the uh, strigosa means just stiff hairs. Um, this fern has as its claim to fame for a shade garden the fact that its foliage is so free of damage. It is not really that uh, bothered by the snails and slugs in our area. Of course, we don't have slugs like they have in the Northwest, but uh, it tends to have almost completely uh, free of any damage. It's a very Drought tolerant fern, moist tolerant as well, grows under quite deep shade, um, under quite bright light, uh, at least uh, 70 to 80% of uh, sunlight. And it is, however, tardily de deciduous. It loses its leaves about the last week in December. 
or depending of course a little bit on the weather conditions and then we'll actually start to flow, leaf out again quite early as, or, and early as in March and so it is a fern that uh, does spread a little bit uh, slowly um, it not uh, um, uh, uh, invasive like some of the ferns can be. Uh, one that grows probably about uh, 12 to 14 inches tall and certainly an asset in most garden settings. Another little trick that uh, shade taller plants have is that some of them have like the begonias and the ferns they have their upper epidermis cells on their leaves. The upper layer of their leaves have little uh, cells that act as tiny lenses and tend to focus the light on the internal chloroplasts inside the cell. Here's an example of two of our leaves um, where we have here, this is a, my, uh, my, a leaf with the upper epidermis and this is the mesophyll, this is a vein in that leaf, and this is the lower epidermis. Likewise over here, the middle of the leaf here, and the upper epidermis, the lower epidermis. Now, if you look kind of closely here, you'll see that in this leaf here, that upper epidermis has sort of a flat surface to it. Whereas on the one in the left here, you see that that upper epidermis tends to take on sort of a lens shape uh, appearance. And what, if you look at it with an electron micrograph and look at those lens shaped cells, they kind of remind you of a plastic bubble packing material. But the key is that that convex type of surface to this uh, epidermal uh, cell is able to focus that light down into the cell where the chloroplasts, the organelles that have the chlorophyll in them, are sitting at the bottom here. These chloroplasts are large enough that they are acted upon by the gravity, and so they settle down at the bottom. Well, by using this particular system, one of the most shade tolerant plants in the world, a particular fern, can grow in less than 1% of sunlight and it takes advantage of this light focusing system. It only has about uh, up to a dozen, but they're large chloroplasts, again, enabling those chlorophyll, or allowing those chloroplasts to be acted upon by the uh, gravity and to settle down. Most plants, in contrast, would have many more and much smaller chloroplasts. So the combination of having the large chloroplasts and the focusing uh, epidermal cells makes for a very uh, uh, shade tolerant plant. Now we've talked a little bit about strategies of plants being able to make optimum use of the available energy. We also know that another approach strategy they can use is they can uh, uh, try to minimize the losses of the energy that's already been uh, captured by photosynthesis and stored in plant tissue. And one way to, of course, do that is to conserve that energy by deterring grazing. Uh, one of the outstanding plants for enabling all of its big medicine cabinet of uh, chemicals and compounds to resist or at least deterred grazing is the bracken fern. Of course, the bracken fern is one of the most widely spread ferns in the world. It grows everywhere but the Antarctica, and it has all of these compounds, the tannins, uh, which are bitter to taste, somewhat toxic. Uh, it has uh, prussic acid whenever chewed on by grazing animals as a precursor to cyanide, which is uh, bitter and, of course, toxic. And it even has these hormones that are the ectizones that uh, the insects use to pr promote molting and uh, can cause uncontrolled molting and even death. And of course, our 
earlier, or settlers and so forth, would use bracken fern to stuff their pillows and mattresses with because that is, uh, you know, uh, these actisone hormones tended to inhibit the fleas from uh, growing and the bed bugs from uh, developing in their mattresses and their pillowcases, I guess. So the bracken fern is a prime example of a plant that has tried to develop deterrence to grazing. Another group of plants are the Elysiums. They have a lot of aromatic compounds. Uh, we have the anise bush is another name for it. The Elysiums have the same chemical as the aniseed uh, used uh, um, in uh, cooking has. The particular plant here is a recent new dwarf that's been found. It's a, a found in just uh, the last about 10 years. And it's small, uh, slow growing. It was found by Ron Miller who lives in Florida, but he found it in Coosa County, Alabama. And this dwarf grows only about eight inches tall, has very short inner nodes, the space between leaves, grows about a foot in five years. So it's very slow growing, but it has the nice benefit of having the full size flowers and uh, does well under uh, considerable shade. In fact, you don't want to grow it in full sun. It doesn't do quite as well under the full sun. Another anise bush, the previous one was the Florida anise bush. This is the Japanese anise bush, Elysium anisatum. It likewise has these aromatic compounds and deters uh, grazing. And of course, it tends to bloom in March with these white, beautiful blooms in contrast to the red ones on the Florida anise bush. But this particular one also has another benefit in that its foliage is bright purple burgundy growth, uh, will almost go to a dark purple as it, it ages even more than when this picture was taken. And uh, that, that glossy deep burgundy new growth slowly hardens off to the green color, but the is a, you have succeeding flushes all through the season. So there's some of uh, this bright coloration nearly all, all summer long. It has a pretty decent growth rate. This particular uh, presentation here is one of the reasons for the name Murasaki no Sato, which means uh, um, purple village. And I guess that's a purple village, if you will. Another very bold flower, a uh, plant that can be used in the shade garden is Aurelia cordata. This is related to our devil's walking stick. This cultivar called Sun King has bright, bright gold compound leaves. And the plus of it is that it retains that bright gold color all season long. There are other gold colored plants, but they tend to viridesce or green, become green in the color as this goes through the summer. This one retains that bright gold throughout the entire summer. It's kind of herbaceous like, whereas uh, like uh, the devil's walk and sick, our Aurelia spinosa tends to be a little bit more woody like. Because it's um, herbaceous like, it's often been used as a vegetable like in the soups in Japan. And Barry Yinger, one of our plant uh, explorers, brought this to the US a few years back. Another one, Dan Hinckley, another plant explorer, has found a plant that he's referred to as Gotinga. It may be uh, the same as the uh, Sun King. But this is a you know, very deer resistant type of plant as well does very well under quite a few conditions. It is deciduous and comes up just a little late in the spring, uh, not really comes out strongly until about the latter part of April. Another plant behind it is it has a nice big bold foliage is the Fatsia. This one is the spider web and it uh, um, has a variegation that doesn't show real well here because in, in these plants, there are a lot of plants like your uh, iron plant, uh, the uh, uh, 
uh, uh, hostas and uh, the uh, spider, the fascias, as well as some other uh, variegated plants. If they are growing with too much fertilizer, they tend to lose a lot of their variegation. The aspidistra was the one I was trying to think of as an iron plant. The aspidistra is another plant that, again, you don't want to give it too much fertilizer because it tends to lose its ability to produce that beautiful variegation. Um, but this spider, uh, th this particular form, uh, Fatsia japonica, has another selection called the uh, uh, Gathering Clouds Brocade or Murakama Nishiki. In the here US, it's sold as camouflage. It has a beautiful uh, foliage that stays uh, nice all season long, tolerates shade well, do does not tolerate sun very well. Uh, a variegated form of this fatia is one that um, has the white variegation, but it's not very cold tolerant and doesn't do so well for us. This plant here is a cross between the fatia we just talked about and the English ivy hedera. So this is a hybrid uh, fatsedra, this is a generic hybrid. And it uh, uh, is a uh, plant that uh, uh, has some of the characteristics of both parents. It has a little bit of vine-like characteristic in that it uh, needs support. It's semi-woody, very drought tolerant, but it adds a lot of nice coloration to it. One of the things that's somewhat interesting about it is that this cross between the Fatsias and the Hedera's was made in a tree nursery in France in 1912. And to my knowledge, there's not been another cross uh, chief between these two. And so it's been propagated for all these years uh, vegetatively and some beautiful selections, of, uh, uh, variegated selections have been found. This one is another one called Lysiae Anamiki. And notice that the variegation is just kind of reversed where the lighter is on the perimeter here of Angiostar and the lighter is in the more middle here. Want to thank you for listen, uh, listening to a few comments about shade plants. This plant here to finish with is a beautiful binding plant. This is our schizophragma, hydrangeoides, hydrangea-like. It's not hydrangea. You can tell it's not a hydrangea because it really it only has this one bract. And if it was a climbing hydrangea, the true high climbing hydrangea, hydrangea anomala, pedialaris, it has uh, four uh, these uh, sepals are uh, on the flower where the uh, schizophragma only has one of them. The schizophragma hydrangeoides is a, uh, uh, has a selection called moonlight that also has this leaf coloration that's quite nice. Again, thank you so much for uh, joining me.